Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Niger's coup and the regional security implications. My name is Tim Eaton, and I'm a senior research fellow within Chatham House's Middle East and North Africa program, and I'm delighted to be chairing this discussion. It is, of course, a very timely one. For those of you who follow Niger, they'll know that despite the fallout of the July 2023 military coup that deposed President Bazoum, and the imposition of ECOWAS sanctions, the Nigerian junta has consolidated its power. As a result, the prospects for returning to democratic rule and resolving the security crisis in the Sahel remain grim. The international community's strong condemnation of the coup, most notably by France and the EU, um, was met with anger by the military leaders and led to the withdrawal of French counterinsurgency troops from Niger. The military leaders have also subsequently indicated that they will reverse the law on countering human smuggling to Libya. And amid recent mediation efforts to return Niger to constitutional order, an announcement was made by the Niger military junta to uh, withdraw from ECOWAS, or their intention to withdraw rather. And that in turn has sparked a major decision in recent days from ECOWAS to lift sanctions upon Niger without preconditions. Uh, the discussion we're going to be having today is part of Chatham House's cross-border evidence and research trends project, known as EXCEPT, which looks to understand how transnational conflict dynamics are likely to affect and be affected by developments in Niger. And we're also looking to understand the regional and international implications of the military leader's reversal of the anti-smuggling legislation. Just to note, um, EXCEPT, research has been particularly looking at the transnational movement of people and its relation to conflict. The EXCEPT programme is funded by the UK International Development. So um, in the webinar, we've, we've got an hour and a fantastic panel who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, three main points of conversation. Firstly, we want to understand and explore the prospects for Niger to return to constitutional order. Secondly, we'll be looking at those transnational conflict dynamics in the Sahel more widely. And thirdly, we're going to look at the regional and international implications of Niger's reversal of the anti-smuggling legislation. So with that, I'm really delighted to introduce what is a stellar panel. Um, I'm joined by Paul Melly, who is a consulting fellow within Chatham House's Africa programme. Paul's work focuses on development, politics and business issues in Africa and the Middle East. And he has written extensively on the Sahel and has a deep interest in Francophone Africa and Madagascar. I'm also delighted to welcome Ornella Modaran, who is a Sahel political and security analyst with extensive experience working for a range of organizations, including the Institute for Security Studies, the Danish Refugee Council and Klingendal's Conflict Research Unit. Her work focuses on the political and security dynamics in the Sahel and West Africa. And last but not least, uh, Peter Tinty is a freelance journalist and a Chatham House Accept researcher. His work focuses on conflict, human rights, security, and organized crime. He has written extensively on organized crime in the Sahel, narcotics trafficking in Mali, and migrant smuggling networks in Africa, Asia, and Europe. His writing and photography has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy and Vice, among others. So with that brief uh, uh, introduction, a quick note about how this session will work. Basically, I'm going to go to the panelists and ask them a couple of questions. Each question, they'll get five minutes to answer. And so we'll spend about half an hour uh, in that process, leaving the remaining 25 minutes of the hour for audience Q&A. As we go along, um, our audience members feel free to um, drop um, messages, uh, drop questions in the Q&A as they occur to you, and we'll collate them and put them to our panelists once we've got through the discussion with the chair. I should note that um, this conversation is on the record and not under the Chatham House rule. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, after that probably slightly longer than necessary introduction, let's make a start. And um, Paul, 
I wanted to start with you, if I may. I wanted to ask you to kind of set the scene for us a little bit and, and explain to us what you see as the main political developments in Niger leading up to and since the coup in July 2023. Thank you very much, Tim, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone for this interesting discussion today. I think one of, one of the things that we need to remember is the shock when the coup happened. Uh, there have been, as everyone will know, a series of coups across Francophone Africa over the last three or four years. But it's fair to say that the coup in Niger on 26th of July last year caused, I think, much more shock, much more um, uh, worry, in uh, particularly in West African and in Western government uh, policymaking and government leadership circles. And there was a tendency, the immediate reaction was to say, but this is extraordinary. After all, Niger is a country with a solid, solid institutions. It's just had in 2021, had a democratic election, uh, where um, power was peacefully passed within the same party, but in an open multi-party electoral contest from uh, Mohamed Usufu, the previous president, to Mohamed Bazoum, uh, who took office in April 21. And um, the shock was deepened by the fact that over the last 10 or 15 years of security crisis in the Sahel, Niger had positioned itself as one of the most stable and reliable military partners uh, and support partners for um, the not only the West African effort, but the wider United Nations effort, the UN peacekeeping in Mali, and as a key security partner uh, of Western governments, a number of whom had troops in the country. So. All of those things uh, led to really provoked deep unease when the coup happened. But actually, I think we need to remember that Niger's history, recent history, is rather less stable, rather less purely democratic uh, than uh, one likes comfortingly to believe. Like most Francophone African countries, it saw a wave of people power protest and peaceful change to democracy at the beginning of the 1990s with a national conference process where the incumbent military regime basically negotiated with uh, political groups, civil society and so on, and a multi-party system was set up. Um, but we shouldn't forget that in 1996, so only six years after that change, um, that uh, political system was overthrown in a military coup led by uh, Ibrahim Barimaina Sara. And he remained in power for three years. And then he, he, the military, the period of military rule ended in a, in basically when he was assassinated by other elements of the military. They then did restore a multi-party political system, but this lasted only for about a decade, and by 2009, the civilian elected president, Mamadou Tanja, who himself had originally come from a military background, uh, started trying to dismantle the democratic constitutional structures and prolong his stay in power. And that provoked another military coup. This time we could say a, quote, democracy coup, if you like, but... Um, there was very heavy pressure from ECOWAS and the international community on the soldiers to say, you only stay in power for one year, um, and then you do, if, if the coup is motivated by Tanja's de decomposition of the democratic system, you, you, you've got to set up a free democratic system very quickly. And they they honoured that agreement, and that's the thing that tends to shape our, our perception of Niger, thinking, ah, this is the country where the army are on the side of the democracy. But actually, the history is more complicated than that. And the political context is also complicated because you have two main political traditions in Niger that are particularly strong, a social democratic tradition, uh, incarnated, if you like, by... Um, uh, pre former President Isufu and then by President Bazoum, uh, 
Um, but you also have a slightly more conservative tradition uh, incarnated by the MNSD party, which was basically set up by the military at the beginning of the 1990s. And the current prime minister in the junta's government, Lamin Zene, he is in fact uh, an MNSD, MNSD guy uh, and was a senior minister in Tanja's government for quite a number of years. So the whole picture, you have this sort of overlap between military and democratic culture. Um, and so the picture, the picture, the political context out of which, not just not just out of which the coup comes, but in which the event the military leaders may be thinking about uh, how to move back to a democratic transition is, is a rather more multi-layered one. Uh, but there are some aspects of Niger that are possibly uh, a bit more stability encouraging as we look to see whether the country will in fact pursue that course of progress mm -hmm. back to democratic rule, which is that relations between pastoralist communities in the north and um, the farming communities in the sort of southern, more agricultural farming belt are, have been rather more better managed. It's not that they're absent, but there is a tradition in Nigeria politics that those uh, pastoralist communities, the northern communities, are much more incorporated into domestic life. And so the Tuareg rebellions that took place in Niger were essentially resolved through much more peaceful negotiation, in contrast to the whole series of conflicts that have marked Mali over many years. Um, there was a rebellion, but it's a negotiated outcome. So I think okay. I won't go into the ECOWAS discussions with, with the junta now, because um, that will overlap with other panelists and we can perhaps come back to that. But I think I want to come back in particular. Thank you, Paul, for setting the scene there is where you alluded to, um, you know, prospects of what will um, come next. Um, but before we do, um, Ornella, I'd like to bring you in. And um, we've just heard that some of the structural shifts uh, within Niger um, could you put that in a regional uh, context for us? What what implications did the coup have for the wider region? And to what extent would you say it relates to wider regional dynamics? Thanks a lot, Tim, for, uh, for your question. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so, you know, following up on the points that Paul was raising, I think one key element to remember is that uh, Niger does, like many other countries in the region, in fact, have a long history of military coups. And uh, that this particular one, the one that happened last year, took place in the wider um, regional context of what some have called um, a wave of coups that has resumed since 2020. So um, this is, I think, an illustration of the broader kind of democratic backsliding trend that we're seeing in West Africa, which military coups are sort of the epitome example of, but which also plays out in many different ways, including in countries that have not undergone coups. You know, things like um, ex executive aggrandizement or um, uh, institutional and judicial capture by the executive and, and things like that. So um, this, I, I believe, is one of the main regional trends you could argue that this is actually a global trend that's also playing out uh, in the Sahel and in Niger in, in particular. So that's one element. Um, a, a second element is that because of uh, the fact that several coups had already happened in the region before, uh, be it in, in Mali, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, and even in Chad, um, uh, the occurrence of a similar event in in um, in Niger raised serious concern for regional actors, especially for the ECOWAS uh, as a regional bloc, that this could become a broader trend and that the, this could essentially threaten the basis of regional political stability. So um, more than just what the impact of the coup itself on the wider region has been, I think one question we should ask ourselves is, the impact that ECOWAS's reaction to the coup has had on the broader region. And, you know, this has been an impact, in, um, um, a very strong impact in terms of 
uh, revealing some of the challenges that ECOWAS as a regional bloc is facing in implementing the democratic norms that it, uh, it claims to, to stand for. Uh, some mistakes have been made in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, threatening a military intervention that never really came about or imposing economic and commercial sanctions that hit the Nigerian people extremely hard, but without actually turning into political gains. So as you were mentioning in your introductory remarks, ECOWAS has now removed these, uh, these uh, sanctions, but without having actually uh, obtained any of the demands it has. So, you know, former President Bazoum or deposed President Bazoum has not been released. There's no clear plan for the transition. There's no clear plan um, or even talk of elections, really. Um, and uh, the national dialogue has not happened and, and so on and, and so forth. So clearly the coup and, and the, the ECOWAS reaction to it have contributed to consolidating this existing trend of political disruptions. And also another important point, it has contributed to uh, created the conditions for an alliance of so-called coup makers in the region. So um, there used to be already um, uh, a bit of a reproachment between Mali and Burkina that were already going through similar uh, processes. But with Niger, which was until then considered one of the um, uh, last bastions of stability, especially by Western uh, analysts who maybe were lacking a bit of the uh, finesse in understanding what exactly was happening in the political life uh, domestically. Well, now with Niger and that team essentially came about the Alliance des États du Sahel, the Alliance of Sahel States that was created in um, in September last year and is in fact a challenge to ECOWAS and to other regional outfits. Um, so uh, these are some of the key uh, elements I, I could raise at this point. I think, you know, we, we could say about more, a, a lot more about uh, the economic impact as well, but I wouldn't want to step on the tongue of uh, Peter, as they say in West Africa, so we'll step it here for now. Thank you, Ornella. Really clear um, contextualizing there of the broader regional situation. And certainly I think, um, economic impacts of these moves are something which we will delve into in some detail, no doubt, as well in the in the Q and A. Um, Peter, bringing you in, um, a very good morning to you. I think what we might be just gone five a.m. for you, so thank you for joining us and and looking uh, looking awake um, must be tough. But wanted to ask you, uh, particularly with relation to the research that you've been doing, um, really how regulation of the mobility economy came to play such a big role in Niger's governance and with relation to its international relationships. And wanted to ask you specifically um, what we might make of the declaration that the anti-smuggling legislation um, was set to be repealed. Um, we can't hear you at the moment, Peter. I think. Sorry, first one of the session. What an honor to have been the first person <laughs> to get to, to unmute their microphone. Um, well, thank you for your question and good morning and uh, afternoon and evening to, to everyone who's joining us. Um, this question about the, the uh, mobility economy in Niger and, and the decision by the, the new government and the, the junta to, to repeal the law that criminalized uh, the, the migration economy in northern Niger I think is a is a really interesting one. I mean, we know that this decision to to pass the law in 2015, um, which didn't really get implemented until 2016, had the very practical effect of criminalizing this mobility economy, particularly in the city uh, of Agadez, which had featured for uh, quite some time as a real hub of migration activity. Um, what, depending on your proclivities, you might refer to as irregular or illegal migration. Um, facilitating migra migration from uh, West Africa and really much of the ECOWAS community towards uh, North Africa, particularly via Libya. And so the, the first very practical impact was just the economic impact. Um, thousands of, of, of families uh, in Agadez uh, lost, this had an impact on their livelihoods, both for those who were directly involved in 
um, migrant transportation or migrant smuggling, those being drivers, people who arranged trips, people who were very um, directly involved in facilitating these journeys, but also all of the actors that were indirectly involved. So restaurant owners, people who were running foyers uh, in uh, what were referred to as migrant ghettos, everyone who was kind of part of this ancillary mobility economy. And at the time, at the height of, of this, this uh, migration boom, you might say, um, even local authorities, right, were very sanguine about the economic benefits of, of this industry. Um, so there was there's real material impacts uh, of this income stream disappearing. Now, we know some of these migration routes merely got displaced, uh, but there, I think it's fair to say, looking at the raw numbers, there was a reduction uh, in migrants passing through this one area. Um, but even setting aside the quite important political impact, uh, sorry, an economic impact of, of this decision to, to criminalize the, the, the migrant economy there. Um, it also had the impact of reinforcing some of the narratives that have been longstanding, particularly in northern Niger, that the government, the, the government based in, in Niamey down south, um, was putting the interests of, of foreign powers and, and potentially international partners uh, ahead of those of its own people. So this law was passed very much uh, with under heavy pressure from European partners who wanted to stem these flows uh, that were going to North Africa. And then, at least in theory, many of these migrants would have been con potentially continuing on to, to trying to reach Southern Europe via maritime crossings. Um, so there was that perception that this was yet another in a long list of examples of the government um, prioritizing external interests over those of its citizens. Keep in mind, Northern Niger is also a place where there's significant mining interests and particularly the uranium mines that had been, that are in Northern Niger. Uh, local communities have often said, right, they never saw the benefits of those economies. The, the material benefits uh, went abroad, went to a small cohort within the country, but also to, to France, right? So that's the, the context within which these narratives uh, are forming, are circulating, and are gaining increased traction um, after criminalization. The other political impact, I would say, is it also called into question, maybe soured some of the attitudes towards European partners amongst local populations. Um, as the presence of foreign personnel increased in places like Agadez and um, more money was poured into programming and NGOs built around this idea of managing migration or reducing migration flows, uh, there was some development programming that intended to uh, defray the economic costs to the community uh, of, of criminalization. The benefits didn't really seem to make it down to the local population, or at least weren't perceived to be making it down to the local population. And so, again, these narratives of there's foreigners in our country uh, operating in, in ways that don't seem to be benefiting us. And, and that's taking place again within this milieu of uh, what's going on elsewhere in the region, anti-French uh, and anti-French uh, military uh, sentiments being uh, gaining increasing currency in places like Mali and Burkina Faso, as well as Niger. So it's not just these economic impacts. There's also the, the political and socio-political impact. And then finally, I would say, you know, this takes place within these wider developments of um, we have uh, a gold rush in Niger that's has altered some political economies in the north, uh, perceptions of potential kind of lawlessness or banditry or increased insecurity among certain communities uh, in the north, uh, perceptions of some armed foreign actors from throughout the subregion coming to Niger to participate in these uh, gold economies. So there's, there's a lot of security dynamics going on at the very local level. Now, the reversal of this uh, law that criminalized migration uh, will almost certainly mean that that uh, migration will will increase and that migrants will start arriving in Agadez again. We'll probably see a return to and, and already are in some ways the return of the old system um, and the old political economies. It's very likely that many of the actors who were previously involved in it will will mm. will continue their activities. But I think the one thing to keep an eye on is, um, at least in its last iteration, there wasn't particularly high levels of competition or armed competition or violence for control over any of these routes and economies, at least within Nigerian territory. Uh, 
we just don't know if that same if the same exact modalities and the same exact political economies will um, emerge this time around. And so it is worth keeping an eye on to what extent there might be new dynamics that could lead to violent competition or some conflict over control of these um, migrant smuggling systems. Right. But we do know that this did have an impact and probably likely will have an impact in southern Libya. So um, it is worth keeping in mind to what extent the return of this migration economy could impact conflict dynamics uh, across uh, the Nigerian border in southern Libya. Thank you, Peter. Uh, some really fascinating points there and also helpful things to look out for. Um, just sticking with you briefly, um, I think you alluded to some of this, but what kind of impact do you anticipate that the withdrawal of French troops and the recalibration of security co cooperation with Western powers is likely to have within Niger? Well, uh, being mindful of time and also that uh, I know Arnella and Paul are probably going to have some comments on this front uh, um, as, as we continue. You know, I think one of the obvious implications, right, is that this very much marks the end of, of a very specific era of French military intervention in the region. Um, it was one thing for them to leave Mali, but that had been in many ways a long time coming. Uh, Burkina Faso as well, where the presence wasn't even that robust, compared, certainly compared to Mali and Niger. But um, the you know Niger had been this perceived pillar of stability and co and willingness to cooperate with the French on counterterrorism initiatives in the region, and so that's a major disruption to uh, the status quo in the region. I think additionally, in addition to the French mission that was called uh, Barkhane, um, there's also the um, there was also Task Force Takuba, which had sort of been on life support, which was the um, EU led uh, special. There was going to consist of special forces operating in the region, and these types of missions, I think, are unlikely to 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 be reinvigorated and to continue in the area um, as a result of of this decision by the Nigerian government to pivot away from this type of cooperation. Um, and then the elephant in the room, of course, is, is Russia and the extent to which uh, private military actors such as Wagner Group um, may uh, start cooperating or may, may be invited in by the Nigerian government. I don't wanna speculate too much there, get too far ahead of ourselves, but um, those dynamics, you know, Russian influence in uh, the activity of Wagner Group in Mali has has played a significant role in the conflict dynamics there. And I think that's maybe the next, um, that's what a lot of people are keeping an eye on, right? What, what will the relationship between the Nigerian government and Russia look like going forward? Um, one final part of piece of that puzzle is right, the US is still present and engaging with uh, in the in, in the government in the country and, and engaging with the Nigerian government, which um, puts it in a slightly different category, puts Niger in a slightly different category than Burkina Faso and Mali in terms of uh, its posture and its kind of working relationship with the US, at least when it comes to uh, uh, military presence and cooperation. Understood. I think that tees up um, some of the considerations on the regional level, bringing you back in, um, Ornella, of questions around what are the drivers of external states um, engagement with Niger and how should regional bodies such as ECOWAS and the broader international community seek to shape their engagement with Nigerian authorities? This discussions around the sanctions and things that seems to be a pretty interesting case in point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your question is um, is actually like three questions wrapped in one. <laughs> If I if I look at it, but um, to try and keep it brief, I think you know uh, Peter was just hinting at some of the key drivers that have to do with uh, foreign actors' interest in security and in migration around Niger. So I, I will start with there first. Um, uh, the U.S., for instance, has made enormous investments in military in military infrastructure and cooperation in Niger, and is clearly unwilling to let that go. So. That's one element that we have to keep in mind when we think of, you know, what a global leader uh, is adopting as a posture uh, in this particular context. There's the case of France also, which is which has historically been 
um, uh, the main foreign power in the region, including in Niger, due to the colonial history. And France has, um, uh, in fact, uh, with this coup lost, as I was saying earlier, um, a country that had become the last bastion of its military presence in, in the central Sahel, left aside the, the enduring exception of Chad, uh, which, in, which is indeed forcing Paris to rethink uh, yet more, much more fund fundamentally that it was saying it was doing, um, uh, the rationale and the modalities of its presence in Africa and whether that presence has to be at all. Um, but beyond that, you know, uh, Peter was just talking about uh, mobility economies, which is also something that's central for the European Union. Uh, migrations have been so high on the uh, European um, uh, internal uh, policy agenda for years now. And this is definitely an agenda on which Niger used to be a key ally that has um, now gone. So these, uh, these are some of the key drivers, I think. But Looking beyond that, I think, you know, there are also a number of um, uh, economic elements that we should keep in mind. French companies' interest in the country's uranium in the north is often cited, but this really is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, looking much more broadly, you know, uh, if, if you start from closer, closer countries to like going in concentric circles into um, a more uh, extended area, uh, one, one could argue that a country like Benin, which is an immediate neighbor of uh, Niger, has vested interests, um, as well as China, which also contributed in those investments uh, to make sure that the country's oil exploitation system actually gets to work. Uh, and to some extent, you know, countries like Benin and Togo uh, also have interest in ensuring that Niger's international trade continues to tr transit through their ports. Um, uh, yet a bit further, Morocco, for instance, recently extended a collective offer of cooperation to Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, which suggests that the kingdom has both economic but also political interest in using the current upheaval of international uh, relations in, in the region in order to position itself, to consolidate its power, because um, actually, Morocco does have a very strong soft power, especially economic soft power in the whole of West Africa and especially in the Sahel. So this is an opportunity to consolidate that, but also uh, to make some diplomatic gains in a context where, you know, uh, ECOWAS is being challenged and uh, there is an opportunity to uh, create a different type of uh, regional integration there, perhaps um, one that Morocco would not be uh, necessarily left out of so much. Um, and yeah, so the, there are just uh, all kinds of various interests, which I think take us back to the fundamental point that whereas it may look from afar like um, uh, Niger is a an isolated hint, interland, uh, poor country with limited uh, security capacity and so on, actually there is a number of um, uh, factors that suggest uh, that the balance of power might not be so clear and that, in fact, uh, Niger has some very strong arguments to kind of um, uh, uh, push or force foreign actors to come back to dialogue. And here is where uh, the the very, you know, the very um, uh, sanctions heavy and threat driven strategy that the ECOWAS has taken from the start has uh, proven ineffective and not just ineffective, but in fact counter counterproductive because it also turned against, um, it, it fired back essentially by turning uh, a large part of Niger's population, but more broadly of the regional population in West Africa against the uh, the uh, the regional bloc. So um, how, how do we go from there? I think, you know, at this point, um, uh, it's probably um, uh, time and, you know, the, the recent decision to leave these sanctions is in a way an admission of, uh, well, some would say weakness, or you could also say lucidity simply that, you know, the balance of power is such that uh, there is a sort of status quo that is established and external actors should seek to restore constructive communication channels with Niger's authorities, whoever they are at this particular moment and, and time, um, and try to build a new uh, agenda with them. 
In doing that, though, I think you know some lessons should be learned from the mistakes that have been made in um, in neighboring countries. And yeah. I'm thinking of Mali in, in particular, in terms of making sure that this conversation is centered around needs, but not just the needs of the state and the state elite, but the needs of the people. So trying to have a much more um, a people-centered, needs-based discussion on what areas of engagement and cooperation should be, as opposed to having a very um, uh, Western-centric conversation about just, you know, how do we counter Russia, which is something that I, I have to admit tends to uh, get on the nerve of West African stakeholders who feel uh, completely um, uh, looked over uh, with that type of uh, approach. As someone who works on Libya, I'm very familiar with those discussions as as well. They're certainly frustrating. Um, got some great questions coming in. I'll just ask one final question um, to Paul, and then we'll get to your uh, to questions in the Q and A. But Paul, um, as you noted in your initial uh, remarks, um, there are questions around what's going to kind of happen next. Uh, the junta has announced that it will work towards elections within three years. That seems like quite a generous uh, time frame to be offered. So what are your expectations for the governing authorities in the coming year? And to what extent do you think they will be able to address um, some of these political, economic and security challenges that the country faces? Thanks, Tim. And I, th I think um, in terms of the actual timetable, we, we should treat that with quite a lot of caution. We've seen uh, in the case of Mali, for example, the timetable's been revised, reduced and increased, reduced and increased uh, several times by the junta there. And uh, there's no reason to expect anything different in Niger. Uh, j late last year, the prime minister um, did a public webinar where he announced that they would be setting out a sort of proper uh, agenda for how they were going to go back to um, constitutional democratic rule um, in January. But a detailed agenda hasn't really been set out. Um, and his essentially the junta's current sales pitch, if you like, is to say, well, we had to seize power because actually... Uh, Niger was being very badly governed. There was a lot of corruption. It wasn't really democratic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's obviously that's a partial view. It's their argument, but it it isn't one that actually necessarily all of the Nigerian public uh, would accept. Um, it was quite noticeable towards the end of Isufu's presidency there was a lot of popular frustration with corruption. There was a feeling that although the government had been democratically elected, it um, had become complacent, too tied to vested interests and so on. Now, although Bazoum had been a senior minister in that government, he had um, distanced himself quite a bit from its legacy once he became president and he oversaw a quite serious anti-corruption drive. Um, and one of the factors that many people speculate may have provoked the coup is that Bazoum had announced some months before that prosecutors examining a military procurement scandal, which of course potentially could set, threaten senior military figures, would be allowed, these cases wouldn't just be settled with a sort of civil settlement, um, but there could be criminal prosecutions. And so, and Bazoum himself was viewed by ordinary Nigerian, who's quite individually popular. A typical remark was that he was um, a good president, but could he escape, as it were, from the legacy of the vested interests that had clustered around his party over the previous two presidential terms? And so, out of out of that context, I think there's going to be a sort of tw twin track process. If if the junta consider, dis accepts, if you like, to continue discussing with ECOWAS, there'll be a sort of diplomatic path. Um, and in December, there were, there were report, reliable reports that 
Um, Togolese mediators on behalf of ECOWAS had reached a provisional agreement on a transition of 18 month, 15 to 18 months. So that process could go on. But I think also there's going to be some sort of bargaining going on with Niger, within Niger itself because of the rather complicated party political dynamics that I mentioned earlier. And because a lot of senior figures invest have in um, in politics and the military will have an interest in in essentially some sort of that when if and when constitutional order is restored and i think it probably will be when eventually just because although that's the only way niger will fully recover if you like its access to the full sort of panoply of international cooperation and role in the diplomatic system and so on um but that there may want to be some sort of underlying elite bargain between military and political figures over the basis on which such a, a, a restoration of constitution, constitutional rule happens. And people will, in Niger, will be, especially within the elite, they, they may have noticed what's happened in Mauritania, where the previous president, who actually gave up at the end of his second term and there was a democratic election. His successor from the ruling party took over, has now been convicted of corruption, sent to jail. Um, and this has caused deep rifts in the ruling elite, motivated by clan rivalries and things. Um, now, people, I think in Niger, there may want to be some sort of deal that when, if and when dem elect multi-party elected rule, democratic rule comes back, that there's some sort of understanding of the basis on what, on which that happens. Right. And the final point I think worth making is that although ECOWAS, as Onella was saying, has basically had to recognise reality, the sanctions were counterproductive, they weren't working, um, they, in doing so, um, ECOWAS has... Uh, leaders in ECOWAS are trying to re, 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 remind people of the benefits of actually being in the bloc. Remember, people, and especially this is important for the poorer yeah. landlocked countries, you have free movement, um, much easier trade and so on. And so that also could be a bit of a factor. Thank you, uh, Paul. Okay. Uh Getting to the questions from from the audience now. Thank you. Um, loads of um, come in. We'll get through um, as many as, as we can. I'll, I'll group them as well to give us the kind of best shot of, of doing that. I guess to start off with, um, there are questions from Ian, Edmund and Mark, which really relate to the relative influence of external actors. Um, they ask uh, uh, the impact of French investments uh, and interests of uh, recent events. And connected to this, um, Ornella, that, that question, which is irksome in a way, I mean, how should um, uh, we view the relative influence of other powers, Russia, China, Turkey? Um, I'd like to um, offer, offer this question to you first in terms of um, uh, relative external interests, if, if that's okay, and pick up perhaps on any threads that you think are particularly important. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, the question of um, uh, global interests essentially playing out in the region and, and in Niger in particular, you know, um, there are definitely a number of foreign powers that have interest in uh, either developing uh, economic and commercial relations, political and diplomatic uh, relations, uh, military cooperation, and so on, uh, with the Sahel globe, generally speaking, including with Niger. And that includes some of, um, uh, well, some non-Western countries. And here I think, you know, a bit of the, um, I would suggest actually just looking at, uh, at this question in the reverse way, not uh, not from a, a threatened position of you know the Western power who feels they're being pushed out, but really looking at what is going on in terms of interests and um, and values alignments and so on. Here, I think you know um, there is such a thing as 
the rise or return of so-called strongman politics. That's one of the key leading trends in the Sahel and that speaks to the political systems of uh, some foreign um, uh, autocratic countries. I would think of, you know, places like uh, places like Turkey, like Russia and so on. These are also places that have uh, something to offer in terms of um, military and security cooperation, uh, however limited or how, however specific. So Turkey has been very much invested in, you know, um, uh, uh, drone provision, um, and Russia has been very much invested in trying to get more clients for its private military companies and things like that. So this uh, reminds us of, of the need to, to think of uh, cooperation, not just in terms of um, what do we think um, uh, Sahelian partners want or need, but what do they say they want and need, and how how can we really engage in, in that co conversation with them? There are many other countries, actually, uh, but clearly, you know, I'm, I'm focusing here on on a, a handful that usually raise the most concern from uh, uh, Western partners. I'm conscious of time, so I'll just leave sure. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, if the panelists are able to be as succinct as that, that'd be great. Give us the best chance to get through. I guess um, connected to that slightly, Peter, there was a question about um, the role of the US and um, uh, one of their bases, bases, base 201, I believe, and also the potential um, need to repay um, $550 million in, in US uh in, in debt. Um, I wondered just any comment on the US side of this, um, um, of, of the story here, but also there's a question from Omar about um, how some of these shifts that we see might impact the drug industry and drug trafficking moving across uh, the region. Sure, well, those are two uh, pretty complex questions, so by no means low hanging fruit. Um, uh, starting with the, I guess I'll start with the second question. Well, I'll, I'll uh, apologies to the questioner because it is a great question regarding the U.S. involvement. Um, in terms of paying back that debt, I don't really have uh, anything substantive to add on, on that particular detail. Um, in terms of U.S. engagement in the region, I, I do think you know there's there's clearly been a willingness within U.S. policy circles to um, Kind of try to hedge, hedge, hedge on how to respond to uh, the the junta. Given that you know, in theory, the U.S. by law has a very specific response when it comes to certain types of military and bilateral aid to states that where there are coups, um, and they have sort of the U.S. government sort of the Biden administration more or less tread water for as long as it could, and and tried to basically thread the needle and saying that certain amounts of cooperation, it is a coup, but certain amounts of cooperation can still or will still be be continued. Um, but in general, I think a lot of that is a reflection of the assets that the U.S. already has on the ground and doesn't necessarily want to roll back right away, uh, notably the drone base outside of Agadez, but also some other sites where uh, the U.S. has a, a military footprint. Um, but I, I do think kind of globally, strategy towards the Sahel and West Africa, and this does go into one of the other questions in the chat, um, at least from the U.S. perspective, it is very much pivoting to uh, the, what are often referred to as the littoral states. Um, so trying to uh, reinforce and, and provide uh, more support and pivot engagement to states like Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, um, other littoral states where they're bed uh, in uh, Togo, where there is this perception, right, that the the instability that has been incubating in the Sahel is spreading further and further south. Um, with the question of drug trafficking, I mean that that's you know we do know that Niger does remain a transit state for um, drug trafficking in the region. There have been some pretty prominent in seizures in recent years of um, cannabis resin. Uh, both cannabis resin cultivated in, in Morocco that would probably transited through Mali, through, through Niger, likely for to go to onward markets in, in probably Libya um, and then elsewhere from there. And also fairly sizable seizures of, of cocaine uh, in Niger, where that cocaine entered uh, West Africa or the African continent is not as clear. Did it come from 
uh, Guinea-Bissau or Guinea, uh, the, um, that part of the Gulf of Guinea, or did it come up through um, Benin or, or, or Nigeria? There's a lot of debate and, and hand-wringing over trying to understand that. Um, I don't know that the coup itself has uh, tangible, direct, obvious impacts on this trade, but I, I think it is probably, I think we can say with some accuracy, right, that the actors that are involved in this this type of trafficking are probably pretty, um, have, have proven over the years very adept at being able to continue their activities regardless of some of these um, disruptions or changes in government that have taken place within the region. It's often maybe a, a there's a period of kind of recalibrating the networks to the and reformulating alliances according to the new realities on the ground. But the I think the basic, basic schematics of these um, drug flows continue uh, with only small disruptions here and there. Thank you, Peter. Um, conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is just group a final set of um, questions from the chat together and then put it to our panelists perhaps to respond to some elements of those and then make some uh, final remarks so that we're able to uh, finish on time. And um, I noted in particular that there are a number of questions around uh, the impact of Niger on the broader region um, and also then broader regional dynamics on Niger. So Ali Inka asks about um, movement in constitutional um, mandates and terms. Is this kind of you know these changing um, norms within the AU a problem how could how could that um uh play out uh, gordon asks about the impact on uh, the alliance of sahelian states and perhaps more directly um mohammed asked very specifically about the direct impact on niger's neighbors of, of the coup um so if i could just put out that um question to uh, to you first, Paul, uh, and then any other final remarks in if you could keep it to two or three minutes. I know that's a massive range to so just be as uh, selective as what you want to pick and perhaps uh, leave with us as some final thoughts. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I think I think, um, yes, a, a key a key point which really will influence both the political evolution and really the way Niger's relations fit in that regional context is that West Africa is actually relatively quite integrated, especially at the ordinary human level. And that's very true of Niger. About half of Niger's population, for example, are Hausa. The Hausa community are also a very large part of the population of northern Nigeria. There is a huge, dense, constant economic and human movement back and forth across the border between north central nigeria and north and southern niger um and which is probably through smuggling one of the things that sustained the economy over the last few months of sanctions but also means that there is quite a driving powerful pressure uh to if you like at the social human level to um somehow sort this mess out if i can put it simply like that and and the sort of also there's a a final practical point that there's a natural economic complementarity between the Sahelian economies and what they produce, which and particularly in the case of Niger that tends to be livestock, and then either desert or cold weather crops, and the markets for those things in coastal West Africa, and then in return coastal West Africa is a source of manufactured goods and critically, um, food crop supplies, cereals, maize, and so on, uh, and, and rice for, for Niger. So I think those dynamics are going to be very powerful in, in trying to push, push the process, shape the agenda going forward. Thank you, Paul. Um, Onelia, over to you. Any of those points that you wanted to come in or any final thoughts you wanted to leave us with? Yeah, you know, we had um, uh, a number of questions, as you mentioned, on, on the regional impacts, and I, I think we've covered some uh, some of that already. Maybe one thing I could come back to is, you know, uh, the first question about constitutional mandates and just more broadly, the, the, the overall trend of democratic backsliding. I, I think I started my remarks by that, and I'm, I could add here. 
by saying that um, it is true that twos are just one particular, um, particularly obvious, but one specific type of expression of a broader problem, which is uh, the weakness of democratic systems um, and the kind of shallowness uh, that they they rely on in many West African countries. So um, one of the things that has considerably fragilized ECOWAS's fund and cr credibility in the region is this um, um, perceived approach of you know double standards, whereby the organization has been very critical and very um, uh, very strongly opposed to military coups, but has been a lot more lenient towards softer uh, forms of uh, democratic process manipulations, like you know um, having constitutional manipulations by incumbents willing to overstay their welcome and uh, things like that. Uh, one thing we could wonder about, you know, the context in which Niger's uh, sanctions were were released um, just a few days ago is whether the, the ongoing crisis in, in Senegal, for instance, could have anything to do with that. Like how, how uncomfortable is it for the for the regional bloc to maintain sanctions on Niger while not really saying anything much about Senegal on the other hand? Um, so these things are definitely interconnected in several ways. Um, and we could have a, a whole uh, separate webinar on, on what that means for the region, what that means for Benin, what that means for Togo, what that means for, you know, other countries. Um, perhaps just my very last point, if I have to provide just one wrapping um, concluding remark, is the centrality of political economy in all this. A lot of the issues come down to this, whether it's, you know, uh, trafficking networks and so on, whether it's how... Uh, power dynamics function within the security sector and within the political elite. This has, I believe, been perhaps a bit of a blind spot in a lot of the political uh, political analysis we've had in the region for the past few years. And that's definitely something that the ongoing trend of militarization is inviting us to, to revisit quite substantially. Thank you so much. As a political economist, I very much endorse that last remark. Um, Peter, uh, final thought from you. Um, well, I, I hesitate to start talking because I think Ornella just did a really nice job of, of offering that, that final remark. And I will echo uh, both what she said as well as what Paul said regarding um, the political economies and, and the, the realities of economic integration, both at a kind of um, more global level, but also on that very interpersonal level and the ways in which uh, communities that uh, the ability to cross these borders and engage in um, economic activity across these borders is incredibly important to to so many communities across the region. And that's in part why I think the, the sanctions regime kind of lost popularity quite quickly and why the appetite that certain states within ECOWAS had for continuing them uh, may not have lasted as long. I also think we should note, I mean, we haven't really talked about the alliance of Sahelian states, but I do think that strategic decision to form that grouping uh, by Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger did allow them actually to operate with one voice, uh, to put pressure, um, and also the announcement that they were leaving, uh, that they want to leave ECOWAS uh, together. These actions on the unified bloc have really, I think, um, made it clear to a lot of actors within the region, right, that uh, as a as a block, their ability to to gain concessions and to negotiate uh, is much stronger than if they were acting independently. Um, so I, of course, we need to to think about, uh, as, as all the panelists have said, um, the ways in which, uh, you know, there's an entire geopolitical context to this, we shouldn't just think about Niger in isolation, Mali in isolation. Burkina Faso in, in isolation, let alone, right, the ways in which uh, these developments are also impacting um, ECOWAS's posture towards places like Senegal, Guinea um, as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, an incredible number of questions in the chat. So very sorry for those of you that we weren't able to get to. I think it's clear that this discussion could go um, a very long time. Um, I found it fascinating today hearing about the uh, 
um, cross-border implications and the transnational, truly transnational dynamics that are at play here politically, economically, militarily, on an interpersonal level, on a state-to-state -state institutional level, very, very complex um, situation. I will finish off by making one blatant plug, though, for a couple of papers that we do have coming up on our Accept project that are exploring some of these uh, interconnections through the lens of human mobility. So do keep your eyes out for those in um, the coming months. But with that, I'll just close and say thank you so much to our panelists um, and for all of you to joining us. Um, it was a great discussion and I look forward to uh, future discussions on this topic. It's clear that we've got quite an agenda to get through in future. So thank you once again.